a very good afternoon to all the delegates, resource persons and members of the organizing committee and especially the delegates who have joined online. On behalf of organizing committee of this symposium on HIV organized by Manipal Center for Infectious Diseases, PSPH Mahe Manipal, Department of Infectious Diseases and Department of Community Medicine, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. I, Dr. Sneha D. Malya, Associate Professor from the Department of Community Medicine, KMC Manipal, extend a very warm welcome to all of you. As we observe World AIDS Day today, we thought it would be meaningful to deliberate on key aspects of this important disease of public health concern, which globally affects about 39 million people at present. India too has about 24 lakh people who are living with HIV and AIDS at present. This year, the theme for observing the World AIDS Day is Let Communities Lead. It signifies that the world can end AIDS with communities leading the way. Organizations of communities living with or at risk of or affected by HIV are the front line for, for the progress in HIV response. Communities connect people with person-centered public health services, build trust, debate, monitor implementation of policies and services, and hold providers accountable. With this brief introduction, we move on to the scientific sessions for today. We have three talks today from faculty from the Department of Infectious Diseases, KMC Manipal. I request the moderators for the session, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Community Medicine, and Dr. Vasudev Acharya, Professor and Unit Head, Department of Medicine, KMC Manipal, to moderate the sessions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Chairperson Dr. Ashwin with me, We'll invite, uh, income, uh, welcome you all to the symposium on HIV. I think there are some program in the morning as well. So this symposium has three talks. And the first talk will be on the neurological manifestation of HIV. You know that all these systemic uh, complications in HIV can be due to multiple issues. It can be virus related. It can be opportunistic infection related. It can be a, a complication of drugs also sometimes. Or maybe what you call a non-AIDS complication. Or rarely maybe unrelated to HIV. So it's, it's a very vast topic. And uh, to discuss on this issue, I invite Dr. Nitin Gupta, who is an experienced person in this uh, management of this HIV, who is Associate Professor in Department of Infectious Disease, KMC Manipal. Dr. Gupta, please. And the time for this is 30 minutes. Thank you. So uh, I'll start my lecture. So this was supposed to be a, a interactive lecture. Uh, so what we have done is that we have linked our presentation to a software called as Mentimeter. So the idea is that uh, we'll take you through case based scenarios and uh, you have to just press whichever answer uh, you think is, think is the correct answer. So this will help us in better engagement and I will be able to deliver my talk in a better manner. So you can see a barcode here. If you scan this barcode, you will be able to uh, quickly go to the page. If you are not able to scan the barcode, you can go to menti.com and just type the code that is there 16786191. Right, for the people who just entered in scan the barcode right, the idea is to discuss the basic approach of when patients with HIV come with CNS features and we'll do it through a case based uh, scenario and most of these are very simple scenarios the idea is to use them for discussion so all of you have been able to uh, scan the code, right? I'll wait for a minute. Uh, if you're not able to scan the barcode, uh, you can just log on the website and just put in that barcode uh, number. 
right if anybody has a problem we'll wait for a second otherwise we'll continue everybody is okay with it right okay so uh, just a brief introduction so you know cns manifestation as a presenting feature of hiv has been seen in up to 20% of the patients and in patients with advanced hiv when cd4 is less than 200 or less than 100 the neurological dysfunction is very very common it can be seen in up to 60% of the patients like sir mentioned before that neurological complications of hiv can be due to myriad reasons it can be due to hiv virus replication itself it can be due to opportunistic infections which we'll discuss in details and it can be due to malignancies as well so again uh, broadly if you want to uh, if a patient with uh, hiv comes with cns manifestations if you go through these seven questions most of most of what we want to know will be covered through them so the first question is what is the presentation broadly a patient with hiv and cns involvement will have three major presentations so it could either be a meningitis presentation it could either be a cognitive motor disturbance or it could be a focal neurological deficit so when you talk about meningitis you need to know whether this is an acute meningitis for example bacterial or viral uh, acute meningitis or it is a subacute or a chronic course like cryptococcal or tb meningitis when we talk about cognitive and motor things we are thinking of predominantly hiv encephalopathy when we are talking about focal neurological deficits you have to see whether mass effect is there or not and then you think about ring enhancing lesions like toxoplasma tubercul tuberculoma or you think about uh, pmle uh, causing focal neurological deficits so what is the presentation is an important question you need to classify your patient these are the headings under which we'll discuss our cases also then you need to know what are the specific features on physical examination in history for example fever fever is a simple symptom but it's important so a patient with tb very likely to have fever right but for a patient with hiv encephalopathy you might not get fever then a uh, history of past tuberculosis will be important in the patient where suspecting tb meningitis or tuberculoma then you want to see whether there are any lymph nodes a lymph node is an important thing you can see it in tb you can see in cryptococcus and it's also an important source for making a diagnosis a lot of times you're not able to do csf or you're not able to get a brain biopsy for that matter lymph node is a very simple source to get that uh, microbiological diagnosis like you can also have uh, skin can have umbilicated papules so cryptococcus histoplasma talaromycosis all those all these things have umbilicated papules which will help you in making the diagnosis in oral mucosa you can see a candida a candida signifies that the cd4 count is probably lesser a lower cd4 count will tell you probably the patient has uh, one of these uh, aids defining illness so cryptococcosis or toxoplasmosis are very likely in that case then the next thing you need to know is what is the status of hiv so whether the patient is on art or not so if the patient is on a, is virally suppressed on art very unlikely to have something like a pmle or an hiv encephalopathy or a toxoplasmosis tb can still occur in that situation cd4 count is again important you all have seen uh, cd4 count uh, less than 200 le has a higher risk of opportunistic infections if the patient is on steroids so for whatever reason if the patient is on steroids in radiology an enhancing lesion might appear non enhancing so this history of what medication is the patient on and whether the patient is virally suppressed or not is very very important the next thing is radiological appearance like i discussed the three presentations so in these presentations if you have to differentiate what is the possible cause you need to think about what is the radiological appearance then you went then you want to know what are the results of csf analysis this is particularly important if there is meningitis type of presentation so we'll discuss this in details but for example if you get a lot of cellular response which is neutrophilic you will think of pyogenic meningitis right there are some rapid tests which are useful in uh, hiv and cns involvement so for example serum cryptococcal antigen is a very simple test quick rapid test that gives you a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis very rarely you will find somebody who has cryptococcal meningitis but serum cryptococcal antigen is negative urinary lamp for tb is also very specific sensitivity might be a little poor but it is also very specific rpr is important for making a diagnosis of neurosyphilis at least suspecting neurosyphilis 
So I'll take you through some case scenarios, and this is where you have to use your Mentimeter. Uh, when we move on to the next slide, in your Mentimeter uh, app, uh, whatever web application that you are using, you will find the questions, and then you have to use the answer. So this is a 36-year-old female came with fever, headache, vomiting, and blurred vision, and. Uh, there is oral candidiasis. Like I said, it is suggesting that there is a possibly low CD4 count. The patient was on tenofovir, lamivudin, and efavirin. So it's non-compliant. So you're assuming that patient is not virally suppressed. CD4, you don't know at this point of time. Possibly it is lesser. <coughs> In the backdrop of oral candidiasis, you assume that it is possibly lesser. The MRI here is normal. You see CSF has a count of 8. Protein is is slightly higher and glucose is low and you see a lymphocyte predominant count. In the CT, you can see some things, uh, uh, I'll not, so it will be helpful uh, to make a diagnosis here. You see some uh, nodular lesions in the periphery. On the skin, you see some umbilicated, some of them are umbilicated papular lesions and uh, in the uh, in the picture on the top right corner, you will see that somebody is doing lumbar puncture with manometry reading. So, with this backdrop, what single test will you do for a rapid diagnosis? I'm assuming everybody of you can see the question. You can see, right? Okay. So, we'll take like 10 seconds after every question to wait for your response, and then I'll show the results. Right. So, most of you have clicked serum cryptococcal antigen, some of you have clicked toxoplasma and some of you have clicked urinary lamb. Okay. So, this presentation was a meningitic presentation with a chronic meningitis, lymphocytic predominant. You would feel that cryptococcus and TB are your two main differentials. But here, you see that there is a uh, solitary nodular lesion and these umbilicated papules are basically suggestive of cryptococcosis here. The other thing that helps in making a diagnosis of cryptococcosis is that the cryptococcus is usually not very high. So this low cell count is also suggestive of cryptococcosis here. So serum cryptococcal antigen is the easiest test that you can do. It's very sensitive and very specific. Okay. So we'll move on to the next slide. Right. So if you see here the diagnostics of cryptococcus, although CSF usually culture is the gold standard for most microbiological things, but in CSF, your cryptococcal antigen becomes the gold standard of diagnosis. You will see that it has a sensitivity and specificity close to 100%. And in fact, serum cryptococcal antigen will come earlier than CSF cryptococcal antigen. So if a patient has CNS manifestations and serum cryptococcal antigen is positive, that is enough to make a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis. <coughs> okay. So the next question in your Mentimeter web app is, what is the preferred antifungal combination here? And this is based on the current WHO recommendation. Right. So, uh, three people have written deoxycholate amphotericin B plus fluconazole. So, fluconazole as in induction therapy without flucytosin is not recommended anymore. Uh, this was done on a lot of studies that I am going to show later. So, the previous preferred treatment was deoxycholate amphotericin B plus flucytosin. And this was uh, based on a large trial that I am going to show. So, in that trial, the second, third and fourth options were compared and it was seen that the best regimen is deoxycholate amphotericin B plus flucytosin followed by fluconazole plus flucytosin and fluconazole and deoxycholate amphotericin B based therapy was the worst option. But in there, there was a recent trial where liposomal amphotericin B single dose 10 mg per kg along with fluconazole and flucytosin were given. And that had a significantly higher uh, positive outcomes when compared to deoxycholate amphotericin B plus flucytosin. 
So WHO's preferred option right now is the first option that most of you have got it correct. In absence of single dose liposomal amphotericin B, in our setting also, liposomal amphotericin B is very expensive. 10 mg per kg will cost a lot. In that case, you can go for a deoxycholate amphotericin B plus flu cytosine based option. If you are not able to give deoxycholate amphotericin B for some reason or you are in a setting where you are not able to admit patients also, then you can move to fluconazole plus flu cytosine based option. But amphotericin B plus fluconazole is not recommended. Right. So this is from a recent review and you will see that the lowest 10 week mortality is with the single dose liposomal amphotericin B based regimen. Followed by that you have the one week amphotericin B and flu cytosin uh, regimen. So this is the uh, current recommendation. So if you have liposomal amphotericin B available, you give liposomal amphotericin B single dose and then you give oral fluconazole and flu cytosin for two weeks. If you don't have liposomal amphotericin B, move to deoxycholate amphotericin B with fluconazole and flu cytosine. So this is the two weeks of induction therapy. This is followed by consolidation with fluconazole 800 mg and then you have to give maintenance therapy and this is, this is up to a year often. right? So what is the most important non-pharmacological intervention? So this is an open-ended question. You can put whatever you feel is the most important non-pharmacological intervention in a patient with cryptococcal meningitis. Right. So most of you have said that serial lumbar puncture is the most important non-pharmacological intervention. So several studies have shown that because in cryptococcus what happens is that these big E's, they block the uh, CSF circulation and there is very high intracranial pressure which also suggests a possibility of cryptococcal meningitis. In those cases, routine lumbar puncture and reduction of intracranial pressure is very, very important and that is associated with better outcomes. So you said you will see this that uh, between therapeutic lumbar puncture and no therapeutic lumbar puncture there is a significant difference in cumulative survival. Now the next question is will you start steroids for these patients? Right, so this is a relatively easier question. So there was a cryptodex trial that showed that So there was a cryptodex trial that showed that steroids in cryptococcal meningitis is associated with higher long-term uh, neurological uh, consequences. So mortality was not very significantly different, but right. So but uh, there was a uh, slight difference between the placebo and dexamethasomam but long term disability was higher when you use steroids. So this is one of the places where you do not use uh, steroids in the patient with HIV and cryptococcal meningitis. Right. So when will you start ART? You have started the patient on induction therapy uh, with liposomal amphotericin B, fluconazole flu cytosine or deoxycholate time 4 plus flu cytosine. Now when will you start ART for this patient? Right. So a lot of you have written ASAP. So in patients with HIV and opportunistic infections, usual dictum is that you start as early as possible uh, HIV base, HIV uh, heart antiretroviral therapy. But for cryptococcal meningitis, this is an exception. So in this, you have to wait. So in the trial where this was seen, the code trial where immediate ART versus deferred ART was compared, deferred ART had a better outcome. So in that trial, the mean duration after which ART was started in the deferred group was 5 weeks. So therefore the 5 weeks is the correct answer here. So, so this is the code trial and you will see that uh, the survival is higher with deferred ART. Right, so this is something that everybody of you knows that uh, CSF analysis in meningitic pattern will help you differentiate between pyogenic, tubercular and cryptococcal and also viral is also possible here. But between tubercular and cryptococcal there isn't much of a difference but 
soft signs would be that the cellular response is not very high in cryptococcus usually. So the next question is, this is an 18 year old female and you see the patient has uh, some paroxysmal event outside hospital, patient has altered sensorium and neck stiffness is there suggesting that there is a meningitic pattern and this is a chronic meningitis. There is low CD4 count here. In the MRI you see that there is hydrocephalus and diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement and in CSF you see there is a higher cellular response here. So like we discussed this is most likely to be a tubercular meningitis. Okay, so leptomeningeal enhancement, so there are some basilar exudates here as well and you see that there is hydrocephalus, cellular response is high, this is probably suggesting that this is a tubercular meningitis. So what single test will you do for a rapid diagnosis here? So this is an easier question we have discussed. So urinary lamb here makes a, a lot of sense. It's not available often. But when it's available in patients with low CD4 count, CD4 less than 100, urinary lamb has a high specificity. So the sensitivity might be a little poor. But if you see, compared to sputum AFB, which is a sensitivity of 12.5%, urinary lamb has a sensitivity of 37.5%. But the specificity is as close as 87%. So a lot of times when you're not able to get a CSF sample or uh, there are other issues there, urinary lamb is a useful investigation to have. Now what is the preferred treatment here? Will you give ATT? Will you give ATT with high dose rifampicin? Will you give ATT with levofloxacin? Or will you give ATT with high dose rifampicin and levofloxacin? <coughs> so I see a lot of you have clicked levofloxacin as the uh, we have added levofloxacin with ATT. So this is a common practice a lot of times, but it is not something that is recommended. So you'll see the major trial that was done by Heemskirk. So that trial showed that there was no difference between intensified and uh, standard ATT. So the intensified ATT meant high dose rifampicin plus levofloxacin. They did a sub-analysis one year later and showed that if there is high INH monoresistance, then in that case, this might still be useful. But in a patient where there is no INH resistance, in that case, there is no difference. So your recommendation still stands as HRZE. Only if you know that there is high mono, uh, there is INH monoresistance, then you can add high dose rifampicin and levofloxacin. Right. So will you start steroids? This is a relatively easy question. Yes or no? So for cryptococcus, we decided that you should not start steroids. But here the answer is, also you should not start steroids. The reason being that there is a new trial that was published by Donovan et al. This was 2023 NEJM article. Uh, so they, here they found out that adding steroids in patients with TB meningitis with HIV had no significant benefit. So we'll see that there was no difference between death from any cause. So therefore now, at present, you don't need to add steroids for TB meningitis also in patients with HIV. Now, when will you start ART? Again, to compare for cryptococcal meningitis, we decided we'll start ART at five weeks. So here, when will you start ART? Right, so a lot of you have still written ASAP. So like I mentioned, so for most cases, starting immediate ART is good enough. One exception was cryptococcal meningitis. Actually, there's another exception that is TB meningitis. So for TB meningitis, also early ART is associated with possibly worse outcomes. So these are the two exceptions only. So in the trial where early versus deferred ART was compared, here the time was eight weeks. So this is just based on the trials, but possibly you should wait for at least five weeks for any patient with TB or cryptococcal meningitis before you initiate ART. Right, so the right answer here is eight weeks, but even if you say five weeks, I would be okay with that. So this is the trial <coughs> that showed that uh, delayed ART versus early ART, was, uh, early ART possibly would have worse outcomes. So this is another patient. You'll see patient has fever, headache, blurred vision. You see some anterior cervical lymph nodes. CD4 is very high. You see some ring enhancing lesions. They are conglomerating. And you see the counts are 
little uh, on the higher side 38 with predominantly lymphocytic pattern and proteins are little high. So here, what test would you do to confirm the diagnosis? This is an open-ended question, so uh, you can type your answers. Right, so this patient has some uh, ring enhancing lesions, conglomerated ring enhancing lesions, and possibly some features of mass effect. There is, uh, yeah, so how would we confirm the diagnosis? Right. Right, so I see a lot of, some people have written lymph node biopsy, which would be my right answer. So like I said here, that would be the easiest thing to do. So if you have a lymph node in a patient, where you're suspecting tuberculoma, so they are conglomerated lesions in high CD4 count. Like I mentioned, that in high CD4 count, TB is something uh, that you should actually think because other cases are mostly associated with low CD4 count. I would not suggest suspect a cryptococcoma here. Plasmosis is also a little less on the cards. So here, I would actually uh, uh, do a lymph node biopsy and a gene expert in that to get a uh, diagnosis. <coughs> so in general, when you have a ring enhancing lesions, you have three main differentials. One is toxo, primary CNS lymphoma and CNS tuberculoma. So all of them can be single or multiple, but predominantly toxo and tuberculoma are very likely to be multiple. Whereas primary CNS lymphoma, uh, in a good number of patients, like uh, close to more than half would have a solitary lesion. If you have a solitary lesion that is more than 4 cm, then there is a very high chance that this is a primary CNS lymphoma. Then spectroscopy is uh, sometimes it can be supportive, but it should not be used in isolation to make a diagnosis. So in that, in lymphoma, you can get uh, prominent choline peaks. But in toxo and tuberculoma, you get prominent lipid lactate peaks, but no uh, choline peak. But this is something which is uh, a soft sign only. So this is another patient, 39-year-old male patient, headache, altered sensorium. There are no peripheral lymph nodes, no lung lesions, no skin lesions. Patient is ART9, but CD4 is very low, 42. You see some ring enhancing lesions. Note the location. And so which among the following is a helpful for diagnosis? Will you do a serum cryptococcal antigen? Will you do a blood PCR for toxo? Will you do a toxo IgG? And or will you do a therapeutic trial? So I want something that is helpful for making a diagnosis here. Right, so only 1% has mentioned therapeutic trial. Some people have mentioned serum cryptococcal antigen. Yes, it would be helpful probably just to rule out cryptococcus, but it's very unlikely that this is cryptococcus. Isolated cryptococcoma, not very common. Blood PCR for toxoplasmosis is not very high sensitivity. Toxo IgG can be helpful if it is negative to rule out, but in this case where you have a high suspicion for toxoplasmosis, this might not be enough to make a diagnosis. So around, uh, let's say a 40, if, if there's a 40 year old, there is a 40% chance that they have toxo IgG positive just in case, in healthy volunteers. So I'll show you a study which was done in different regions of India and they found out that in pregnant women, the toxo IgG positivity is around 22%. Right, but therapeutic trial with toxo is something which is very, very helpful. So this is an NEGM 1992 study where 80% of the people within 10 days with septran had a good response. So there was good radiological, good clinical response within 10 days. So the easiest way to make a diagnosis of toxoplasmosis is start them on treatment and if they improve within 10 days, this is very likely to be toxoplasmosis. How would you treat this patient? Whether you use sulfadiazine, pyrimethamine, cotrimoxazole, pyrimethamine, clindamycin, or any of the above is okay. Right. So most of you have given the right answer. Any of the above is okay. So we have only cotrimoxazole. Well, a lot of times I see people trying to get sulfadoxine or pyrimethamine. Does not make much sense because there is no evidence that it works better than cotrimoxazole. So there is a recent systematic review. Uh, where they found out that the cure rate with cotrimoxazole was actually better than either of the above regimens. So for our patients, two tablet BD of uh, septran, cotrimoxazole DS, double strength 800 by 160 is good enough. So this is the simplest disease to treat. You can just give these medications and the patient improves within, usually within 10 days. 
So this is a 45 year old male. You see some left sided hemiparesis with facial deviation. Uh, the patient was started on some TLD based regimen at that point of time. The CD4 was 150, but it has now increased to 228. You see some white matter flare hyper intensities. These are asymmetric. You can see on MRI and uh, CSF has some cellular response. Protein is slightly high, but your serum cryptococcal antigen is negative. How would you manage this case? Right. So this is a patient with focal neurological deficits. You see some white matter hyper intensities and there is some cellular response. Patient had good CD4, had low CD4 initially, but now it has increased. What are you thinking? Right. Right. So ART and possibly steroids. So this is a patient with PML with iris. So you see that the CD4 count has increased. And if you see the contrast images, in contrast, there will be enhancement. So at least let us get the concept of PMLE right. So if you have an asymmetric lesion in white matter, you should think of PML. And the treatment for PML is antiretrovirals. Sometimes they can have iris, especially when ART is initiated. In those cases, you have to add steroid for these patients. right? So this is a patient uh, with some floaters and photopsia. And the patient was on ZLN based regimen for eight years. We see a lot of times patients are on these redundant regimens even now. And patient was also poorly compliant. So CD4 was very low. And you see some periventricular white matter hyper intensities and serum cryptococcal antigen is negative. So you see a retina picture and you see the MRI. This is a very easy diagnosis here. So how will you manage this case? So patient has some retinitis has some encephalitis, which is periventricular. Your diagnosis is CMV encephalitis and the treatment is gancyclovir. Right. So this is the last case. This is a patient with difficulty in walking for three months, some memory disturbance. So, so this is the cognitive and motor one that we were talking about. Patient is ART naive. CD4 is low. Patient has symmetrical. Now, here, when you have symmetrical white matter hyperintensities, you should think of HIV encephalopathy. You can have high protein in HIV encephalopathy. But if you have symmetrical hyperintensities that are diffuse, PMLE is more well demarcated. In that case, you can think of HIV encephalopathy up front. Right, I will not uh, waste time on this. So this is the difference between the HIV encephalopathy and PML. HIV encephalopathy is mostly symmetrical and less demarcated. There is one last concept of uh, CNS viral escape syndrome, that is something that you must have heard. So often times, so this HIV encephalopathy is usually in patients who are not on treatment and come with these cognitive motor disturbances. But sometimes you have patients who are on uh, ART, but they still have these cognitive motor disturbances. If you do your viral load in serum or blood and in CSF, you will see that the blood CSF viral load is low or nil, but CSF HIV viral load is very high. In that case, what happens is that some HIV escapes into the CSF and when you have an ART regimen that has poor CSF and CNS penetration, these virus will stay active in the CNS and these are usually resistant. In that case, patient can still have manifestations. This is something which is uh, uh, a little controversial, there are issues, but in that case, using an ART that has a higher uh, CPE score would be better. So an ART with a better CNS penetration. So for example, TDF, atazanavir, these have poor CNS penetration. But dolitegravir, zidobudin have high CNS penetration. Anyways, with this, I will end my talk and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin, for a very wonderful lecture, specifically actually quoting a common cases and as well as with the specific references. I think it was very useful. If not for others, I have I was actually had a good revision of neuro HIV. One clarification, I think sir. you talked about steroids in TB meningitis. Yes, sir. I think the study is only for HIV related, right? Yes, sir. So people should not go back with the wrong impression that non-HIV related still we use steroids. Yes. So the okay. idea is that it was done by the same group, yes. uh, the Thwaites group that did the TB meningitis landmark trial. Yes. So in that trial, steroids was associated with better outcomes. But in the HIV subgroup in that old trial, they didn't find any significant difference. And that is why they did this long, uh, lot of years later, this trial now, 
where they wanted to see an HIV population. So there are reasons related to it also. I will not go into details. We are short of time. But the way uh, steroids in HIV work and steroids in non-HIV work are different. This is their hypothesis. So the idea is to decrease intracerebral inflammation. So in patients with HIV, steroids are not able to decrease the, that intracerebral inflammation. So as of now, adding steroids in HIV patients with TB meningitis is not useful. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, you can directly ask Dr. Nitin whenever he is sitting here. We will move on to the next talk. The next uh, talk is on uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease in, uh, in HIV. I think the topic is very clear. It is prevention of cardiovascular diseases. And to speak on this, I invite Dr. Muralidhar Varma, who is my friend, our colleague for a long, long time, additional professor in Department of uh, Infectious Diseases at KMC Manipal. Dr. Varma, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, unlike Nitin, I think I have a little bit larger crowd so for me to speak. And I thought of doing in the similar way. I was worried because there was no crowd, then how do I ask a question? So I will do a similar fashion, but I will answer all the questions. Yeah. So question is, why are we discussing about cardiovascular diseases and HIV? Because uh, since last 20, 25 years, we've been always, uh, HIV is part of infectious disease, right? When we take for undergraduates or postgraduates. So why are we talking about non-communicable disease in HIV? So let me start with one of my own case, which I started seeing when I was in a final year MD. Then I continued to see him till today. So this man uh, came to us uh, when I was a final year PG as a 30 year old male, he owns a land and he runs some small businesses, came with breathlessness. So our MM7 used to be our casualty, right, he came, he was very sick, I was on duty that day. So then we started oxygen, so that time we were all discussing like any patient, HIV positive, presents with hypoxia, improves with oxygen, then it has to be PCP, that is the only way we could make our diagnosis. And LDH used to be one parameter which we used because that is only data. So we started uh, and somehow we managed an echo. Echo was challenging during our PG times and it showed uh, low ejection fraction. So we assumed that it is due to HIV itself. Either way, we started the patient on uh, cotrimoxol. He recovered. Then we started whatever the standard regimen at that time is 83 TC and PV. And then uh, we had to screen the wife, wife was also positive. Then uh, there were a lot of social issues, which I don't see much now, but that time diagnosis HIV for an patient was a big, big social. There were a lot of people uh, restricted from the villages. There were a lot of social issues and they had a lot of patient and wife passed away. We were not sure what it is. She had a bad infection. There was also suggestion that she committed suicide. So these were the issues that time. But this man did well. Uh, he was following up regularly. He was coming almost every six months to one year. Even, even now he does. Uh, he was virally suppressed. CD4 was good. In 2009, he had an MCA, massive MCA infarct. He came to our hospital on the day three. We started statins, aspirin, and is even now functionally independent. So now about a year back, now he has bilateral hip avascular necrosis, but he still walks to our OPD and comes. So th this is what is the spectrum of HIV we are seeing than what we used to see long back. So we are seeing more of non-infectious diseases right now than infections. Even then, even though we see a lot of infections, but we hardly seen any patient presenting with stroke or heart failure, probably in the late 2000s probably and probably early 2010 we saw a lot of patients. So that was a change. So that was a reason when there were a lot of publications beyond 2005 and 6 which were addressing this issue. So if you look at cardiovascular disease, the non-vascular complications, what I call non-vascular, your pericardial disease, myocardial, your dilated cardiomyopathies, endocarditis, we have seen a couple of cases, drug toxicities typically described in uh, doxorubicin, we don't use it here because we hardly see Kaposis here. So these were all issues we were primarily dealing. 
but now the focus more in the last 15 years is more about MI, stroke, TIS, peripheral vascular disease. So the spectrum has changed so much that people forget that if you remember two years back, but two months less probably two years, Russia invaded Ukraine and everybody said I was watching almost every day, it's a question of two weeks, Russia will overtake. I mean, that was a sense in 2009 10 everybody, okay, we have wonderful ART. Now it's a question of time we will see world without AIDS. So that was, so the thing is, uh, the most complex thing is when we don't understand the disease, we get this guesswork, right? So just like I think uh, Americans never uh, understood the Russians and probably the Putin's ego. And no wonder the war is still going on. Right? So that's the same thing in HIV and cardiovascular diseases. There's so many things were not understood and everybody thought probably we will in a position where we could easily manage cardiovascular disease. So HIV being a terminal illness, like most of our patients when we were junior staff and PGs used to die, is a manageable condition. It's something I keep telling my patients, it's like diabetes and hypertension now. Right? You just need to take your medications lifelong. And cardiovascular disease is one of the most common non aids death right now in HIV, even though it's changing now. And their risk in HIV patients is almost two times for a general population of same age and sex. So reason why you have this, uh, there could be multiple reasons, some of them I'll try to explain, right? There is definitely an increased risk for myocardial infarction, stroke, apart from the traditional risk factors, even if you take out them. Dyslipidemia, as recent data shows, is about in 80% of the patients. The reason is because they're living longer, and uh, the DAD study, which clearly showed there's a 26% relative increase in MI. This is older data, about 12 years old. And 50% of most of the European countries, HIV population are above 50, now the recent data is about 80%. So they're living longer and they're having more age-related issues. And women tend to have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Is it primarily related only to CD4 count and viral load? No, definitely not. So there are far more reasons. In the people who are well virally suppressed, CD4 fairly good, they continue to have vascular diseases. So it could be related to immune dysfunction and inflammation. Higher uh, rates of traditional risk factors like smoking rates are much higher. Adverse effects of ART, part of it we will discuss. And higher prevalence of socioeconomic dissent. If you look at most of our HIV patients including in India, most of them are mid lower middle class and lower than that. So that adds additional risk factors, their health seeking behavior, health access are issues. So that can also add to your cardiovascular disease. So what's the pathophysiology? I will not run through everything. I'll try to summarize in a couple of slides. There are multiple risk factors. Some are known, some are unknown. Even in 2023, we don't know certain reasons, right? The typical one which I have already told you is inflammation. Right? Even after viral suppression, there's a low level inflammation going on. And one reason could be microbial translocation, which happens in HIV patients, right? which will stimulate the immune system and can cause immune exhaustion. And traditional risk factors, as I told you, are becoming more commoner in HIV patients. A lot of these HIV patients are IV drug abusers or habit forming drugs are there. ART toxicity, we will talk about that a little bit later, and HIV infection itself. There is also some data saying that the CMV infection could also increase the risk. The ART immune dysfunction, once you start ART, definitely improves, but not completely, and it is partial. So that, that has been also been proven. The T cell activation causes microvascular disease. So remember that there is tremendous T cell activation also. Uh, HIV is not an immune deficient state, immune dysfunctional state. So the, uh, that led to, that, that all leads to the cardiovascular and strokes. As I told you, there is some data saying that CMV specific responses, 
uh, which underlie immunological aging of HIV and independently predicts the carotid intimal thickness. Even though whether there is a clinical uh, relevance to it by treating CMV is not very clear. If you look at morphology of atherosclerosis, they are different than the traditional morphology of patients who have high risk cardiovascular score. The lower plaque burden uh, they have, but they have higher cardiovascular events. The non-calcified one, remember calcified ones have a lower risk, they do not rupture much. The non-calcified ratio is much higher. They have endothelial dysfunction and there is a clear data where they looked at from CD4 versus uh, viral load suppressed patients. The age of the vessels in HIV patients is much higher than compared to patients who are non-HIV patients. So now that we know that there is a clear association between cardiovascular events and mortality with respect to HIV. Can we predict them? So, can, do you have a tool? This is what was done after the, the one of the landmark trials of Amingham study which showed that okay, we can predict and prevent. So, what about the CVD prediction tools in primary prevention? See the issue with HIV is that the traditional uh, cardiovascular tools did not have some of the risk factors which HIV had. They were still including the same one. As I told you, the one of the first score was Framingham Heart Study in Massachusetts State and that is a landmark trial. They were continuing to use the data in a similar fashion. Only later, in the last 10 years, the lot more risk factors were identified and scores were introduced. One of the score. Uh, was DAD score, right? Uh, I started using in 2011, I mean 2010 or 11 probably it was just uh, published. So it is, a, it is based on a large European HIV patients. It started adding more domains to assess the risk like CD4 count, Abacaver and also the cumulative use, the duration of HIV. So they added more scores into it. But still, they did not include sex, the black race were more higher risk and had a higher proportion, they were not including them. And there was a big problem is the lower risk people were continued to thought to be lower risk, like in the, some, one of the patient which I showed you. So this is just a diagram trying to show you that if you see this, the females uh, percentage, some of the DAD score etc is much lesser. The black race, you can see very few were included. So these were risk factors and Asian population were also not included. So okay, we thought we were much better. So every patient who came to me, I started adding. I had a patient in 2012, even now he comes. Uh, is it true he had a blood, probably blood donation because he had a road traffic accident. At that time we were still using azt 3 tc NPV. I did a DAD score which was available online that time, it came 35, wow it is very high, I started Simvastatin aspirin, right, even though there was no evidence at that time. So he had a rash NPV then we replaced with lopinavir, ritinavir, that was the only PI available at that time, he was affordable, he can do it. So what to do, I remember me and uh, Sudha madam had a discussion because madam used to read about statins, shall we continue etc, because that is the time drug interaction was a big challenge. Uh, we started realizing statins in, can we use statins in high risk CVD patients? So that is the next debate. So patient has a traditional high risk like smoker, diabetic, hypertension, shall we use statins? I think most guidelines convincingly say that with good data available, like if you have a high risk, traditional high risk, whatever uh, score you use, you always start statins. Right? If you look at the IDSA guidelines, I mean you, most guidelines agree with that. The National Lipid Association uh, guidelines also, that part 2 also agree with the same data. So that was the time when we started using but unfortunately we did not have uh, instis that time. So this we thought okay we became better. This was a patient I saw, he is a patient who had a rash and I have diagnosed him as acute HIV, his viral load was more than 10 crores. Then we started TLD he was doing, I just did uh, ACCVD score which came as 18. I mean 20 is the cutoff for high risk, then I said okay let me start him. 
on that. So it started Roosevelt start in aspirin. He promptly stopped. He didn't come for follow up. He came uh, about four or five months back. He was admitted in cardio with NSTEMI. So I was wondering why did he get it? So obviously he stopped his medications, right? So we have hit from extreme other end. Now we have hit the other end where we have some evidence. We are giving the patients now the issue is more of compliance and poly polypharmacy. So just to tell the whole thing in a summary of flow chart. So you have a chronic HIV patients, you look at the CVD scores, high risk, I think there's no doubt, diet, exercise and statins. Now, what to do about this low risk and moderate risk? Because we know all the traditional scores, scoring systems are not good enough to predict, right? So what do you think? Shall we start statins for, all, for low risk and moderate risk? I mean, this was a big debate. I was not starting, so I was looking at scores. Uh, the reason why this debate was there, because ART and statins have drug interactions, right? Typically, they're metabolized by uh, CYP3A4. Uh, so the same pathway. So there was always a risk that they will develop uh, rhabdomyolysis and renal failure. Even though in my patients, I didn't find any, but I can say only my follow-up. But there's enough data to suggest that. So pitavastatin is only statin which has least drug interactions and well studied, right? And there were no major drug interactions with uh, NNRT, CCR5 and also most of the instis. This was one good review on uh, statins. It is a review on statins actually, very good reference article where they have shown the major drug interactions. As you can see, PI and statins have a massive problem. NNRT are generally not an issue, but INSTIs have as you go up higher doses, like lower statin, simvastatin has. I used to use a lot of simvastatin, now we have moved on to rosvastatin. Then came the landmark trial I, we just discussed yesterday, which was just recently published on uh, August 24th. I would say it's a real landmark study, right, where pitavastatin was used to prevent cardiovascular disease in HIV patients. The importance of this study is the cohort is on low and moderate risk. It is not on high risk. So because the high risk was probably well defined and everybody was using it. It's a big cohort of 7,000 odd patients followed up for 5.1 years, then the study was stopped because there was a significant difference between 4 mg of petavastatin group and placebo. So they had to stop and you can see the hazards ratio of 0.65. So that was a significant achievement. Saying that, what about the adverse effects? Adverse effects were there in the treatment arm, one with related to statins, your myocarditis. And remember, statins increase risk of diabetes. So that was also, but the authors felt it was not significant enough. And this is again proved that just by reduction of LDL cholesterol is not good enough in HIV patients, we have to go beyond it. So that is why statins helped because they proved that even though LDL was lower, they still had. So uh, decreasing inflammation is one of, as you know, statins have pleiotrophic effects. <laughs> then one more interesting part I found is probably HCV, unhealthy consumption, substance abuse and more important depression. I think depression is grossly underestimated risk factor for cardiovascular disease and significant portion of HIV patients, I often refer to my psychology colleagues to look for depression is a massive problem in HIV patients. Studies quote up to 30 to 40 percent. So there is a sub-study which is not yet published neither in the uh, next year which will probably be published in six months time where they are looking at whether it really reduced the inflammatory markers to prove their point. I think we will be eagerly waiting for this data to come in the reprieve study. So why was pitavastatin picked up? See the author again is from Massachusetts. So this was the study he was involved, interpret study, where they did a randomized control study comparing pitavastatin versus pravastatin. So the clearly there was an much no major serious uh, yes, effects with uh, pitavastatin. And the follow-up was uh, at least for six months. So probably that is why the authors and the investigators were confident to use pitavastatin. So is, uh, shall we start using pitavastatin or any statin for all HIV patients? Shall we start using from tomorrow? So basically we covered low risk, moderate risk and high risk. 
but it comes with an issue one pitavastatin is a very costly drug in india it is available i am not sure in pharmacy i have not used it it costs about 24 to 40 rupees per tablet i mean it's a huge burden for some of our hiv patients right and can we extrapolate the same thing even though we don't use pis now can we extrapolate there's no data on it right so we should be a little bit careful and of course statins come with their own risk they have their own side effects they increase the risk of diabetes and the landmark trial the jupiter trial also clearly showed there was a higher risk of diabetes in patients using statins saying that probably we should walk a middle path and look at the low risk statins if you look at the uh, risk of progression to diabetes is much lower in pravastatin simvastatin and lovastatin uh, Rosuvastatin is slightly higher, even though that's what we majority of us use it. But pitavastatin definitely has a much more advantage compared to that. So now that we have debated enough, statins should be used. I think there's a good data to use statins in most of our HIV patients. Will it become a guideline? We have to wait and watch what WHO says. What about aspirin for prevention? Unfortunately, like statins, the evidence is very inconsistent. want of time i will not try to put too many slides on this remember unlike statins aspirin if you don't pick your right patients they will have bleeding i'm not talking about uh, cns bleeding gi bleeding and there is a evidence clearly above 60 people above 70 in fact there is a higher risk score the her score risk score will definitely help in assessing and even if you want to use low dose aspirin is what recommended for high risk cardiovascular disease patients will it outweigh the risk of colorectal cancer that is again just uh, an imagination so i thought we'll just put it up we don't know colorectal cancer is generally not hiv is not a major risk factor but in general population the rates are higher now saying that i think we live in a world where we want instant news and that instant news makes us forget what is in the past right that is uh, what we live in so everybody talks about hamas and israel now completely forgetting ukraine war is still going on infections are still the commonest problem we see in hiv patients we still need to address them as if you see nitin slide majority are infections what we deal but at the same time you should also address the recent problem right the higher risk of cardiovascular mortality so what is a way forward for all this i think it's important uh, at individual clinician level and also at the guidelines level that these things are integrated the non communicable diseases and the hiv diseases have to be integrated because these are the cohort of patients who have higher risk for cardiovascular mortality and the other area which i feel they should integrate is sometimes i think monitoring of art drug toxicity is not a not great in some of the art centers probably integrating this will definitely help because most of our patients are uh, doing well nowadays with respect to hiv the viral loads are well controlled etc so that 90 90 90 there should be one more 90 added to it that is 90% of these patients should be screened detected and treated for non communicable diseases diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia i think that is what the uh the government and probably who should look at i know it comes with a cost ashwin might uh, shed some light in it i think one more 90 should be added in that 390s now yeah just to end uh, hiv is no longer limited to infections there is a higher risk of cardiovascular disease is not limited to traditional risk factors and risk scores grossly underestimate no doubt about that i as i showed some of my own patients having stroke despite being lower risk statins probably should be the way to go can we use the say uh, what all the statins that answer is we don't know uh, risk of cost and toxicity should always be added in it and integration of non communicable disease in art management i think is a very important thank you this is the picture i just took in tampa when i was in <coughs> early morning at 6 o'clock right is a beautiful view thank you thank you dr varma for that uh, brief and nice talk and uh, he showed some evidence there i don't get carried away that i don't want to use statin because people get diabetes 
that is the one particular study proved that i think he is scared a little bit i think yeah <laughs> but don't get scared because no, to run there, a program going to challenge to run it in yes, a program yes, yes. yeah it will be a challenge for individual patient no but statins are too good a drug to be used if there is an indicated and ashwin wants to speak something no uh, there's nice presentation dr verma but just i just wanted to know what proportion of this mortality among hi positive you no know, attributed to this cardiovascular component this is new thing like you no know, you said something new but we know something no, no, no traditional it's not new the uh, data is almost like 15 years now okay right so any any study that attributes what is the proportion of mortality among hiv is cardiovascular complication related deaths anything like that just to no understand no gravity i can't remember situation. any indian okay. studies okay. which were uh, done just to understand the gravity that's all yeah so, within the patients who died again this is not a data from india i am sure in india data is still more about infections uh, the significant portion of mortality in the west is due to cardiovascular disease okay because uh, uh, here in india opportunistic infections are more common yeah but it is changing yeah it's changing it is changing. Changing. changing so mortality even in india there were small here and there cohorts which were presented which showed quite a fact of late i can't remember the what is the percentage are due to mis and strokes okay but as you said even now it is this but once you have patients like in our art center if you look at majority are virally suppressed and doing well with cd4 count and they are living longer and longer see uh, one of some of my patients who are following up for almost 20 years they're doing well but ultimately how are they going to die they are going to die like how we are yeah, going to die that's what i'm worried that's what i'm worried yeah. how exactly you attribute uh, this myocardial infection uh, related that to hiv positive patients as an hiv is the cause for that no two reasons one hiv drives inflammation and we are not screening for traditional risk factors for stroke oh. and mi we have to screen them and treat them the issue is do we have enough evidence to treat on a mass scale for individual patient i can use and convince the patient can we run it on a program do, does the government uh, has a vision to do it and money to do it i think that is a challenge i think there is a good evidence now high risk absolutely no doubt i am talking only statins aspirin probably i will not talk too much i usually do it on individual basis and look at my patients aspirin probably is very risky on a program based to start unless we need more day more evidence from indian population but statins probably yes nice sir thank you sir uh, from audience is there any any questions because it's symposium there should be more questions from the audience and its uh, interactions also there are no questions for the anemia yes. yeah i can only tell vouch on what my observations are i have not reviewed the literature whatever anemias i saw are predominantly in women population and they have traditional causes of anemia the second uh, reason is uh, at least in the cohort which i have see are from lower middle class and this thing so they do have traditional risk factors for iron deficiency anemia the third cause of attributed is uh, some of them a small percentage have cs cervix which were missed out which could have contributed to the anemia so i all my uh, women patients i ensure that once in two years they get a pap smear i mean these could be the causes drug as a cause not 5 6 years i have hardly seen because we have hardly used zodovid in last 5 6 years except some patients where their cns escape or uh, some drug related toxicities due to tdf otherwise no most of them will have a traditional iron deficiency as a cause if you're talking about anemia right yeah i, I have not looked at the literature as such that i can tell only based on my practice thank you dr arma again thank you so for the last talk on the today's symposium we will call on dr shivdas rajaram nayak Dr. Nayak is assistant professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases in KMC Manipal, and he is going to briefly tell us on.
how to prevent the mother to child transmission it's a traditional topic but i think there are some changes of late happening so we'll discuss on those issues good afternoon everyone uh, so the one of the changes that has happened with uh, the terminology is now NACO is accepted it as a prevention of parent to child transmission but I'll stick to the parent to uh, prevention of mother to child transmission because the topic was given okay so this will be the overview of today's presentation which I'll be dealing with uh, to introduce uh, it is one of the major routes and is the most common cause of uh, HIV infection in children uh, as per the UNICEF data around 130,000 new infections have occurred last year Okay. If you look at India, as per uh, data from NACO, mother to child transmission attributes to 4% of uh, HIV infections overall if we consider adult as well as children. And transmission can occur during uh, the pregnancy or during labor or while breastfeeding. So when we try to prevent the transmission, we have to target at all three levels uh, with appropriate interventions. In the world, PMTCT was first introduced in 1994. Uh, uh, there were people in Cuba and it was a successful program. Uh, but uh, since 2011, when the guideline has been implemented and accepted by all, there is a tremendous success. Uh, from 2011 till date, there is about 58% reduction in the uh, transmission of uh, infection from mother to child. But we are still far away from elimination. But uh, WHO has targeted elimination of uh, this event by 2025. Okay. When we look at world epidemiology, um, in 2010 the rate were around 23 percent, but last year it has reduced to 11 percent. In India, uh, it was 40 percent in 2010. Uh, by 2020, it has reduced to 27 percent. And as I already say, said, WHO is targeting elimination of uh, uh, mother to child transmission and wants a rate of about less than 5% by next end of next year. Okay, so now we look at what are the risk factors for the transmission. They can occur during pregnancy or they can be during uh, breastfeeding. So the factors which determine increased risk of transmission during pregnancy are the high maternal viral load or advanced HIV. Uh, if there are maternal co-infections, malnourishment, uh, premature or uh, prolonged rupture of uh, amniotic membranes mm. if the mother is in prolonged labor, if there is instrumentation during delivery in the form of forceps or vacuum. There are some genes which are responsible which I will not go into detail and uh, it can uh, the risk is higher if mother gets infection during pregnancy and not before. The reasons are still to be explored but this is found to be one of the risk factors. When you talk about labor, uh, there are micro transmissions during uh, each contraction uh, which uh, increases the risk of transmission from mother to the child. Uh, it can be uh, due to ascension through the cervix or vagina during normal delivery and uh, it can be because of absorption of the virus through the uh, infant digestive tract when it swallows the amniotic fluid. Uh, during breastfeeding, again the high viral load is uh, the major risk factor and clinical or subclinical mastitis increases risk more. If a child has oral ulcers, then the risk of transmission is also increased. Uh, the risk is cumulative, that is, uh, the risk increases as the child goes on feeding with the mother. Okay. So uh, this table shows what are the risk factors for, what is the risk of transmission during each stage. If you look overall, that is from the antenatal care to the end of the breastfeeding, the risk is about 30 to 49 percent if you do not intervene. Okay. Uh, alone during pregnancy, the risk is 8 to 10 percent. Uh, the risk during labor is 12 to 15 percent and breastfeeding varies from 12 to 26 percent. Uh, when we offer ART to the patient with breastfeeding, the risk is reduced to 2 percent and if we offer no breastfeeding, then the risk goes down to less than 1 percent but it is never documented that this will be zero. So this has to be mentioned when you are counselling your patients that you may not, we may reduce to less than 1 percent but we absolutely cannot guarantee that it is zero. Oh, seems like that, sorry. So uh, apart from 
this uh, we have to look at what are the effects of HIV as an infection on the development of the fetus. So during pregnancy there can be increased risk of spontaneous abortion or stillbirth. There can be increased perinatal or infant mortality, the cause I will come subsequently. Uh, the child can have in, uh, intrauterine growth retardation or there can be premature delivery and ultimately the, patient, the child lands up with low birth weight. Uh, if you look at the infant, the risk of uh, progression of the disease when compared to the adult is faster. Uh, they will have uh, risk of recurrent LRTI and neonatal sepsis is also higher when compared to general infants. So one of the neglected aspects is what are the challenge with prevention of mother to child transmission. So one of the major challenges whenever we should do studies or trials pregnant population is usually excluded and whatever data we are uh, uh, collecting it is implemented from the data which is generated through the non-pregnant uh, females and as we know that uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, parameters change during pregnancy because of the uh, physiological changes these are generally ignored and we uh, land up saying that the drug is not effective or we have adverse drug reactions. We also do not have the transport of drug during pregnancy. Whatever data we collect is based on the uh, uh, comparison of maternal data with the cord blood which is taken after delivery. So we don't know how much transmission or uh, of the uh, ART drug given to the mother is uh, going to the fetus. Also during pregnancy, uh, they uh, keeping the mother adhere to the treatment is challenging primarily because of the uh, pregnancy itself. The mother will have issues like uh, hyperemesis, then the obstetricians may not want to give oral medicines or uh, the patient will think that uh, the medicines will affect her child and she will not take. Also, we do not know what, what will be the long term effect of antiretroviral therapy on fetal development. Because it is a successful uh, program, uh, it has tremendously decreased the uh, transmission of HIV from mother to child. No one is actually looking at it and is practically prescribing everyone because prophylaxis overweighs the risk. So these are the uh, headings under which we can actually prevent uh, transmission. One is universal maternal testing and counselling, uh, ART to the mother during pregnancy, labour and delivery, offering elective cesarean section, uh, ARV prophylaxis to infant and counselling regarding infant feeding. So I will go one by one. What, we, what can we do before or during the pregnancy? So first thing is screening for the screening of both the parents for HIV. Initially it was only restricted to mother but now NACO has uh, uh, progress for screening of both the parents. Preferably we should screen before they plan a pregnancy rather than waiting for mother to come in antenatal checkup. Uh, this can be done at community level. Uh, we have uh, ANMs and ASHA workers which uh, do a good uh, household screening. So if uh, a newly married couple they find they can go home to home and offer them uh, a screening option when they are married. Uh, NACO has now started a four pronged approach for this where uh, all re females in the reproductive age are offered screening for HIV irrespective of their married or not. Okay. Uh, uh, then second would be to counsel parents regarding the risk of transmission to the mother if they are positive. Uh, we can offer them contraception and uh, preferably avoid any unintended pregnancies. Uh, they should be counselled regarding drug adherence and uh, we should not allow them to miss uh, medicines. We should uh, counsel them regarding adverse drug reactions during pregnancy. We should uh, make sure that their nutrition is adequate as so malnourishment is one of the risk factors for increased transmission. We should uh, give the uh, importance to mother nutrition as well. Uh, as Murli sir was saying that uh, patients, there is still st uh, psychosocial stigma uh, that should also be taken care of and we can offer them psychosocial support. From the day one of pregnancy, the parent should be counselled regarding feeding practices and ART in infant and it should not be done, uh, it, like we should not start uh, telling this about at the end. 
uh, this will help them prepare themselves as well as their baby once the delivery occurs next would be viral load testing uh, this uh, is generally done before labor uh, at around 32 to 36 weeks so that we can uh, plan for post exposure prophylaxis for the infant also uh, we should sc actively screen the mother for opportunistic infections and associated comorbidities like diabetes and uh, so the sexually transmitted infections and offer treatment for the time okay. what can we do before labor so one thing uh, the patient should not have delivery at home that should be ensured we should promote the patient to have uh, institutional deliveries which are well planned it should not be like that patient should come in emergency to your uh, emergency department or come as emergency during labor this should not happen we should well plan when the delivery can occur for the patient uh, generally pediatricians will do uh, nasogastric suction to uh, remove the uh, muconium uh, this should be avoided because uh, it is a high pressure vacuum kind of thing uh, but we can use bulb suction which will be a low pressure setup uh, we should not milk the cord or delay cord clamping uh, cord clamping should be fast and milking should be avoided so if the patient is virally suppressed that is at the end of uh, if we send uh, viral load at 32 to 36 weeks we find that the viral load is not detected then normal delivery is preferred we should not ask patient to go for lo lower uh, lower section cesarean section uh, that is restricted only to obstetric indications okay but if we don't know what is the viral load or if the patient is not immunologically suppressed we should act prefer cesarean section because as I mentioned one of the risk factors for transmission during labor was the uh, micro transmission during contractions uh, this can uh, increase the risk of transmission during the labor next what can we do during breastfeeding so as a, uh, one of the thing would be counseling regarding breastfeeding what they would like to do okay the, there are two options which we can offer one is exclusive breastfeeding and other would be exclusive uh, replacement feeding well both have one uh, advantage and some cons also but we should not allow uh, mixed feeding okay mixed feeding will increase the risk of diarrhea as well as risk of hiv transmission okay as per indian guidelines and naco uh, exclusive breastfeeding is preferred over exclusive ref uh, replacement feeding it is because of the poverty uh, so initially we'll offer them exclusive re replacement feeding for 15 20 days patient parents can afford but subsequently they will add uh, water to the uh, replacement feeds which will uh, satisfy the hunger of the baby but it will not give nutrition support this will in addition uh, cause diarrhea as well as malnourishment to the child uh, subsequently the mother will go for breastfeeding and then the risk of transmission will be more okay so what ARTs can we offer to the pregnant lady so these are the uh, ARTs which are safer in pregnancy. Uh, the NRTI includes Abacavir, Zodovudin, Tinofavir, Emtricitabin and Lamivudin. NRTIs include Ifavirans and Nevirapin. The protease inhibitors are Atazanavir, Daronavir, Lopinavir, uh, which is Ritonavir boosted. And our newer drugs, that is Integrase inhibitors like Doltegravir and Raltegravir, they have been safe, found to be safe in pregnancy. The regime is usual, uh, the same, that is we give two NRTI backbone, one from the upper half and of the NRTI and other from the lower half, that is one drug from Abacavir, Zodovudin or Tenofovir and the second drug from Emtrizidabin or Lamivudin and the third drug will be either an INSTI which is preferred or a protease inhibitor or an NN NNRTI. Uh, in India now we are phasing out the NNRTI, so either it will be uh, INSTI or a PI. The preferred a regime given by NACO is tenofovir lamivudin doltegravir combination okay. uh, what antiretroviral therapy for the infant so infants are classified as either high risk infant or low risk infant it is based on what was the maternal viral load before labor so if we know that uh, the mother was uh, uh, virologically suppressed we classify the mother as uh, classify the infant as low risk infant and NACO uh, offers single ARV either nevirapin or zudovudin and if mother is born to uh, HIV 2 uh, if baby is born to HIV 2 positive mother then uh, lopinavir ritonavir can be offered okay. high risk infants are those which are born to the mother whose HIV viral load is not 
known or the load is more than 1000 and in them we give dual drug ART that is neverepinephrine and zodovudine syrup. Uh, the duration of prophylaxis is from birth till 6 weeks of age but uh, whether we should continue this or whether we should stop at 6 or 12 weeks uh, I am not the right person to answer this. To summarize, uh, if we diagnose pregnancy, uh, if we diagnose that mother is pregnant before, sorry, mother is HIV positive before pregnancy, uh, we should offer pre-pregnancy counseling at ART and ICTC centers. If she becomes pregnant, the same ART can be continued. We should do viral load testing at 32 to 36 weeks and we can also do it before pregnancy so that they can plan their pregnancy once they are virally suppressed. Uh, LSCS or caesarean section only for obstetric regions or if viral load is more than 1000 and infant feeding if uh, low risk single dose if high risk then dual drug. Okay. So to conclude mother to child transmission is preventable we can do this by screening and treating early we should monitor close with the uh, viral load testing at 32 to 36 weeks. We should plan delivery and PNC uh, postnatal care well in advance so that uh, this can be prevented. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajaram Nayak, for that brief and uh, very lucid lecture. Anyone has any questions to ask? Uh, how and uh, when they finally declare this baby is free of HA infection or positive? So we test the baby at the end of one and a half years, like 18 months they do testing for antibodies. If it is positive, then uh, it is declared. Like if it is negative, then we declare it as negative. So telling about like uh, we should give ARV only for 12 weeks, I would not be the right person to answer that. I think that's why you kept quiet. <laughs> yeah. Is that to continue or not? We don't have data, sir, actually. Okay. We use only two drugs there, right? Irrespective of if the viral mother load, mother's viral load is high at 32 weeks, do you use three drugs for infant? Two drugs, sir. Only two. Yeah. Three drugs are not. We still have that debate whether to go for three drugs or not. Uh, I think that's uh, sure. Uh, longer time, probably after after longer time also probably after uh, two years, three years. Yeah. Four still, years it is two drug to, only. Needs to be checked also HIV status with all that. Then only you can no, confirm. Ah, so we decline. don't have data how many are getting ah. actually converted to positive infants. Programmatic so is, programmatically it is like you said, yeah. no, at one and a half years they say. But still after that what happens without ART? So no, we don't have data yeah, to answer that, that question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I thank all the speakers for their excellent session and the audience as well. I thank the chairpersons for moderating the sessions. Uh, I request uh, Dr. Manu, uh, Professor and Head of Respiratory Medicine, uh, to hand over a memento uh, and a certificate of appreciation to our chairpersons. For concluding, I think both myself and Ashwin thank uh, Kavita and her team for inviting us. It was a very nice experience for us also. We listened to the nice uh, lectures here. I request Dr. Ashwini Kumar, uh, professor and head of community medicine to receive a certificate of appreciation. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Dr. Vasudev Acharya, sir, to receive a certificate and memento of appreciation. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar to hand over a memento and a certificate uh, to Dr. Muralidhar Verma. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Vasudev Acharya, sir, to present a memento and certificate to Dr. Nitin Gupta.
Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Kavita Sarau to hand over a memento and certificate to Dr. Shivdas. Thank you. Uh, now we'll have a short uh, tea break and we'll resume for quiz uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the quiz will be conducted by Dr. Praveen, uh, Assistant Professor from Department of Infectious Diseases. I request all the postgraduates who are participating in the quiz to have a quick tea and uh, come back for the quiz.
टीम चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स वॉट इज एंड्स एड्स ओके या एनिमल्स वॉट इज बिग टाइगर बिग टाइगर ओके हाँ या एलिट कंट्रोलर ओके हाँ यार उसके पास मत रहो ना एलिट कंट्रोलर ओके फाइन सो विल स्टार्ट विद द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन Seconds only to answer. <coughs> so, I think Victor Graver is the group who answered it right, but very slow. So you get five thirty-six points. Yeah. So maximum you can get nine ninety-nine, but uh, yeah, five thirty-six is what you got. ओके क्वेश्चन एक्सप्लेन करेगा ना हाँ सो बेसिकली इंटरमीडियंट ए आर टी समथिंग विच वी आर डिस्कसिंग फॉर टू थ्री डेकेट्स एंड एवरी टाइम वी डू अ ट्रायल इट इज फाउंड दैट इंटरमीडियंट ए आर टी इज असोसिएट पोअर आउटकम्स देन वी हैव एन इंटीग्रेज इनिबिटर्स इन अवर मार्केट सो बेसिकली वंस यू पुट द पेशेंट ऑन इंटीग्रेज इनिबिटर्स एंड पेशेंट इज वायरली सप्रेस सो इवन इफ द स्टॉप ए आर टी द वायरस टू गेट रिएक्टिवेटेड इट विल टेक फाइव टू सिक्स डेज so if you are giving 4 days on 3 days off probably uh, there won't be any viral reactivation that is the hypothesis so that is tested in one trial called qatar anrs where they gave 4 days on 3 days off the idea was to bring the cost down but at the same time they thought that because we are giving intermittent art the side effects will also come down but once the study was done it was found to be non inferior to daily art but the thing is the amount of side effects was same one of the reason why one uh, one of the reason for one of the explanation is once you stop art again you restart the body will take some time to adapt again so that is the reason for the side effects happening with intermittent art so only thing that was true uh, about the question was intermittent art was non inferior to daily art provided it is a integrase based regimen and four days on three days off regimen okay congratulations bikta agravir yeah so first option is associated with low to intermediate risk that uh, that is i think you are able to see that completely right first option yeah so answer to aa gaya ha so uh, right now you had a class right beta statin was uh, in reprieve trial uh, low to intermediate risk acvd risk uh, the profile uh, beta statin is associated with decrease in uh, significant cardiovascular events the second option taf dtc is associated with more weight gain that is true so if you are putting someone on you can see viropil there with tdf with dolutegravir based with regimen that will have more renal side effects compared to taf ftc with dolutegravir based regimen which will have more weight gain so taf ftc definitely taf with dolutegravir combination dolutegravir itself can cause weight gain but when you combine it with taf the weight gain will be more okay so second option is also right third option cabotegravir has higher resistance barrier compared to dolutegravir which is wrong okay uh, dolutegravir and bictagravir are same cabotegravir is a softer molecule when compared to dolutegravir and bictagravir and fourth option zidovudin has a better cns penetration compared to tdf that is the right option yeah 15 seconds for these questions only 15 seconds the questions which we need more duration we will give it yeah so we'll go to the next question okay identify the prescription with no drug interactions
So the options given were TLD with rifampicin. There is a drug interaction. Whether it is significant or not is something to question. Uh, but we do give a dual uh, dual integral regimen when the patient is on rifampicin based regimens for ATT. At as anywhere, it's very important to know that uh, uh, it requires an acidic environment to get absorbed. So if you are adding pantoprazole or uh, uh, H2 blockers for any patient who on adizanivir retinavir based regimen, there is a risk of failure. Again, uh, any integrase inhibitors, if you are giving along with a divalent cation containing regimens, the absorption can be decreased. So dolutegravir you should not be giving along with calcium. Okay. Same with any antacids which can contain magnesium or aluminum. So the right answer is dolutegravir and voriconazole doesn't have any interaction. Okay. Which is which of the following is not a treatment option for pneumocystis pneumonia? Primaquin, clindamycin, inhalational pentamidine, caspafungin, all can be used for treatment. Okay, so the treatment of choice is of, of course cotrimoxazole. Uh, but we do use primaquin and clindamycin in a population who are not able to tolerate. Echinocandines, there is some data uh, showing that if you combine it with uh, cotrimoxyl, there is a mortality benefit. Pentamidine, uh, typically inhalational pentamidine is used for prophylaxis, not for treatment. And if you are using it for treatment, probably you have to give IV. Yeah. So inhalational pentamidine is the right answer. As you understand that these are the questions, are all, all of them are repeats, right? So a part of quiz is repeat question. That is the reason why we didn't discuss last time. Yeah. So points for the people who search for the answers. So Chennai Super Kings were the quickest to answer this question and they are leading the table. Fifth question. A pregnant woman, 24 weeks of gestation, incidentally diagnosed to be HIV-1 positive, no opportunistic infections. What is the next best step? Okay. The options were to start on TLD regimen. Uh, the other option is because dolutegravir is associated with some neural tube defects, start around if average based regimen. Third is start around protease inhibitors because they have a faster clearance compared to integrase inhibitors. Terminate the pregnancy. Terminate the pregnancy is definitely not a right answer. And uh, in in uh, pregnant women, there was initially there is some concern that dolutegravir may, may be associated with uh, neural tube defects, but that is not very significant. So that is not a concern to start someone on efavirenge based regimens. Third is if you compare dolutegravir with efavirenge head to head, the median duration for the viral clearance in any patient in dolutegravir based regimen is around 30 days, whereas it takes 70 to 80 days in efavirenge based regimen. So as you already saw in the previous presentation, one of the main thing to prevent mother to child transmission is to decrease the viral load to the undetectable. Uh, before the time of delivery. So dolutegravir is definitely preferred over efavirenge based regimen. Lopinavir, retinavir uh, probably is not a wrong answer entirely. If someone is on protease inhibitors, it is okay. But there is one study comparing dolutegravir again with lopinavir, retinavir, dawning study, where it is very difficult to tolerate uh, protease inhibitors. So a pregnant woman with lot of other issues, uh, dual uh, daily you have to take two times lopinavir, retinavir, and that is associated with a lot of side effects. And because of the decreased adherence, it is shown to be non-inferior to dolutegravir. So the right answer is the answer which is stick by three people. Yeah. Options you'll get that in your this thing, no? Ah, huh, you'll get there. So you'll be you'll be able to see the options in your phone only. Okay.
again uh, PPIs are not uh, divalent cations so integrase inhibitors you can give whereas rilpivirin adazinavir retinavir requires acidic media for its absorption so the right answer is dolutagravir yeah So Chennai Super Kings is still leading. Audience, if you should not be answering questions, okay. There are four. Strongylodosis hyperinfection is most associated with. So uh, basically strong allodosis we see in HIV but uh, the uh, HTLV infection is more associated with strong allodosis because HTLV uh, typically inhibits TH2 immunity which is important for strong loads. So any patient who is otherwise immuno, uh, not immunocompromised if he is de developing strong load hyperinfection it is important to screen for HTLV. Yeah? Mechanism of Ibalizumab. So binds to D2 domain of uh, CD4 is the right answer. And you have to understand that if you are producing an antibody against CD4, that can lead to lymphopenia. So that's the reason why specifically you have D2 domain of CD4, antibody against D2 domain. Then uh, GP120 inhibitor is phosphatum severe. So uh, that's a wrong answer, unfortunately. TDF, FTC, DTZ, TDF, FTC, Lopinover, right? So basically the diabetes and obesity is, uh, uh, it is basically there to confuse you. So if someone is HIV2, efavirenz won't work, right? So the inappropriate regimen will be efavirenz based regimen any day, okay? Okay. Ads. So this question you can take time. Once you are ready, I will go to the options. Ready, ready for options? Yeah? Ads? You are ready? Yeah. It is showing as five players.
so basically k103 n is for if average based regimen so if average is out so fourth option is out now you are left with uh, other three options the patient also had a k65 r mutation that will actually confer resistance to tenofovir and patient that virus will be still susceptible to zidovil so before the nadia trial which has changed the practice it used to be uh, to switch to regimens to if average to uh, dolitogravir or protease inhibitors and tenofovir you change to zidovudine that is the idea but in nadia trial when they switched directly to if average or t uh, if average to dolitogravir without changing tenofovir uh, there was no difference in fact patients who are on tenofovir based regimens they did well so the practice have been changed after that so you should not be worried about k65 or or any other mutation so tld still holds good ready for the options okay <laughs> so, uh, other three has CNS penetration, bidaculin that is very important because if you are MDR meningitis then probably if you are giving bidaculin it, it has no penetration even in animal models and whatever human studies are available the CNS penetration of bidaculin is very poor. So, probably that is where you have to ask for a delaminate uh, adding delaminate into the regimen. So, the right answer is bidaculin. Harsha should get negative points for this. A relatively easy question. Yeah, everyone answered it rightly. Keeping the recent evidence in mind, probably we will give only ATT. Yeah. So till now, whatever questions you had. Oh. But anyway, it's everyone okay. answered. Everybody gets like so the thousand points change. additionally. Additionally, so okay. We'll, yeah. we'll calculate that in the end. We didn't take the right option in the key, <laughs> so it's not taken. But anyway, yeah. it's good that all of you got it correct, so it doesn't make any difference. Difference, yeah. You can get fifteen thousand points also; it will not make any Yeah, we will go for options. So, audience, any guess? Okay, the right answer. Basically, yeah, the question is, what is the uh, mechanism of amphotericin B induce anemia it could be multiple pathways it could be hemolytic anemia it could be bone marrow suppression or it could be inhibition of uh, erythropoietin secretion but again you have flu cytosine in your option by doing bone marrow you cannot rule out 
whether it is uh, amphotericin B in induced anemia or flucytosin induced anemia. So if you get a serum erythropoietin and if it is low, that definitely indicates it is amphobe associated anemia, right? So B is the right answer. Now we are seeing some tough competition, claps for elite controllers, yeah. So a patient uh, who is a treatment name, CD4 of 300 cells, 30 cells, sorry, presented with chronic diarrhea, has a 5 microns acid fast round cyst in the stool. So what is the treatment of choice? Okay. So the right answer is antiretroviral therapy. Nitazoxanide is not a wrong answer, but if you are not giving ART, it is not going to go. So basically we are discussing cryptosporidium, 5 microns. So the right answer is ART. Unless you give ART in a patient with CD4 of 30, he is not going to improve. Yeah. Lactate is in millimoles, not milligrams. Okay. Milligrams is what we get in our 20 millimoles is quite high. Yeah, so we'll go for options. So the right answer is metformin, uh, non-ketotic uh, acidosis, uh, like non-normoglycemic ketoacidosis, the lactate should have been normal. So there is an interaction between metformin and dolitagravir. If you are keeping the patient on more than one gram of metformin, that can lead to metformin associated lactic acidosis in these patients. So at least we had two, three patients this year only. It's not very uncommon. Yeah. So. Okay. A case of treatment in HIV with PCP pneumonia, bad PF ratio requiring mechanical ventilation, started sudden having sudden onset of hypotension with hypoxia. What is the next best step in the management of this case? Audience, okay. So, uh, giving an IV fluid is the wrong answer. Obviously, you are looking at either tension pneumothorax versus pulmonary embolism. Uh, but rather than doing CTPA, if the embolism is that bad to cause hypotension and hypoxia, you will something definitely you will find something in the 2D echo, right? Or restrain. So, to look at pneumothorax and pulmonary embolism, the right thing to do is uh, chest ultrasound. 
probably right thing to do would, would have been auscultation also if that is an option yeah starting norad is not a wrong answer but someone with tension pneumo if you st keep starting norad whatever you do is not going to improve so you have to diagnose the case so the right answer is doing a chest ultrasound yeah A teen a HIV patient with CD4 of 110 presented with large volume watery loose stools for the past 15 days with no blood in the stools. Serum alkaline phosphatase is 5 times the upper no limit of normal with normal bilirubin and AST and ALT. What is the most likely cause of this pattern? The pattern which is described is HIV cholangiopathy. The most common organism causing HIV cholangiopathy is cryptosporidium. So unfortunately, <laughs> everyone was wrong. Yeah. Which of the following is true regarding HIVIC? HIVIC is HIV associated immune complex kidney disease. So there are a variety of uh, HIV involvement of HIV involvement of kidney. So one is HIVAN, second is HIVIC. HIVIC is immune complex disease. Unlike HIVAN, which responds after starting ART, HIVIC won't respond to it. And it is not more common in Africans. And collapsing FSGS is a feature of HIVAN in biopsy. So the right option is, uh, it can mimic actually lupus nephritis or IZ nephropathy when if it is an immune complex disease. So you are very particular about managing non-communicable diseases in patients with HIV after this symposium. A 48 year old male who is on lopinavir retinavir based regimen came to your clinic. He is having NIHA class 2 as shortness of breath. On further evaluation, you found the evidence of pulmonary hypertension in the form of high right ventricular systolic pressure and you have ruled out other cardiac, cardiac as well as pulmonary causes of type 1 uh, pulmonary hypertension and you labeled him as type 1 pulmonary hypertension, secondary to HIV, right? Which of the following drug can be given to the patient? So this is a patient who is a HIV type 1 pulmonary hypertension and you want to offer some pharmacotherapy for these patients. So uh, basically it was a class 2 pulmonary hypertension patient is having class 2 symptoms that, that someone with class 1 symptoms probably will not treat. Class 2 to class 4 uh, exertional dyspnea, they, it needs treatment. Sildenafil and Bocentan will have drug interactions because the patient is on low pinover, right pinover based regimen. So the right answer would be Ambrisentan. Yeah? Question can I above yeah. Okay, fine. Which of the following GRT regimen has least CNS penetration score? Huh? So it is discussed just a class before. So, atazinavir right now has poor CNS penetration along with uh, tenofovir. So, that is the right answer. So, 
सेवन ट्वेंटी ओके नेक्स्ट फोर क्वेश्चन वो ही है ना ट्वेंटी ओके सो नाउ देर आर फोर क्वेश्चन वेर ईच ऑफ यू विल गेट टू राइट अ वन वर्ड आंसर दीज आर द लास्ट फोर क्वेश्चन लास्ट राउंड ओके सो ईच क्वेश्चन हैज वन थाउजेंड पॉइंट्स देर इज अ नेगेटिव ऑफ फाइव हंड्रेड पॉइंट्स सो एक्सेप्ट सी एस के एवरीबडी हैज अलॉट टू लूज मेरा वैसे मत खोल भी अरे एक मिनट सुखो सर उसका मैंने ये मेंटीमीटर क्लोज कर दिया स्कोर आ जाएगा आ जाएगा दो मिनट रुक जाएगा so basically you have to write the answer in your sheets we'll take that sheets and uh, this question is even open for audience so if you tell the right answer you'll get a chocolate dairy milk silk yeah latish so before going to this round before going to this round we'll just tell you the scores nahi to confusion hoga na sir जाता नहीं है ओके सो चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स आर एट फर्स्ट प्लेस एट थाउजेंड सेवन हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी टू पॉइंट so next you'll have four questions you can choose not to write anything if you are not writing anything there is no negative marking okay but if you write it wrong you'll lose 500 points if you write it right you'll get 1000 points elite controllers are at second place 5223 points <coughs> team big tag ravir is at third place 400 4612 points ads at fourth place 4332 points right okay so they will display the question and then each of you get 30 seconds to write the answer if you don't give that means no negative but if you give and it's wrong then it is negative questions are a little difficult 1 2 3 you give it's okay e- after each question you give after each question and uh, huh? after these people have answered the audience gets to take a uh, like guess and the first person to get the answer right will get a chocolate No, no, not an MCQ. You have to write a one word. Write answer. the one word answer. Okay. You get thirty seconds, and then we'll collect the sheet if you want. To so this is a gene which protect from that picture and increase the risk of the second picture. is giving okay so audience okay i think it is uh, so basically the first picture you are seeing is african trypanosomiasis so apo l1 gene is associated with protection from Afri- african trypanosomiasis but at the same time that will increase the risk of hiv associated nephropathy hiven so that is one, that is one of the reason why you have lot of apo l1 mutations in africa and they are prone for kidney disease after hiv yeah second question 
this you should take a guess the what is the easiest answer. Yeah. Uh, audience anyone from audience no take a wild guess no negative marks you can see renal stones pr prolongation and jaundice okay so the right answer is at as an aware right on aware Indian aware causes renal stones, but it won't cause PR prolongation. So, so elite, elite controllers, thousand marks, five hundred negative for everyone else. <laughs> okay, team three. Yeah. So the act is more important uh, than the race. So only one person. Anyone from audience? Chagas, this is right, right answer. Yeah, yeah. What? So, uh, basically, it's a redwood bug, and sometimes these bugs will die when they're making a sugar cane juice. So, people drink it and then they get a trypnosoma. Trypnosomiasis usually will cause megaesophagus, cardiomyopathy in normal immunocompetent individuals. In HIV patients, there is a higher risk of meningoencephalitis. In transplant patients, there you will see more disseminated disease. So, trypnosoma cruzi is the right answer. So, 1000 positive for 3. And who got nothing? L ads. Ads. Okay. Last question. No. It's not an essay question, one word answer. <laughs> All the three are linked. All the three are linked. How they are linked, we are not explaining. Audience.
So the right answer is Kaposi sarcoma. Chennai Six. Okay. So the CT pattern is starry sky appearance in Kaposi sarcoma. What you can see is a peribronchovascular consolidation. The other differentials will be organizing pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, or sarcoidosis in that case, and Kaposi sarcoma. Liposomal donorepsin is the treatment, and the picture which you are seeing in the photo is a picture of Kaposi sarcoma, Indian patient. Yeah. So at the end of this round, Chennai Super Kings got. Wait, 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 wait. Total next sir. Yeah. Total this round. In this round. In this hmm. round. Uh, so Chennai Super Kings got 500. ADS got minus 500. Big Tigravir got nothing. And Elite Controllers got 2000. So the final score Elite Controller gets 7223. Right? Yeah. Okay. CSK 8762 plus 500. 8762 plus 500. 7, 2, 2, 3. So, the leaderboard remains the same. So, Chennai Super King 1. Followed by elite controllers and then Big Tigravir. And ads. Okay, that is the end of quiz. Hope you people enjoyed it. Price distribution we are doing now. Thank you, Dr. Praveen, Dr. Nitin. Uh, Dr. Shivdas and Dr. Verma sir for conducting the quiz. Uh, we will shortly give away the prizes.
the third place is uh, won by Dr. Ayush Sharma and Dr. Katakam Santoshi Nikita. Congratulations to the team. I request Dr. Praveen and Dr. Kavita Madam to uh, give the prizes. Congratulations to the winners. Second place is won by Dr. Rashikesh Pandey and Dr. Mujahid Ahmad. I request Dr. Praveen and Dr. Kavita Madam to give the certificate. Dr. Nitin, please join. The first place is won by Dr. Harsha Choudhury and Dr. Salvia S. Raj. I request all the faculty from IFD to join for the... Congratulations. Hearty congratulations to all the participants as well as winners. Hope you all had a uh, pleasant experience. Have a nice uh, evening. We thank MQR. Uh, we thank uh, MQR uh, Pharma for sp co-sponsoring the program. I request uh, Dr. Kavita Madam to give the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Praveen, who conducted the quiz. I would like to give the memento to Dr. Sneha who has been anchoring the program and uh, she is the resource person for today morning's patient awareness program. Thank you so much Sneha for all the things what you have done. Uh, I would also like to uh, call upon Sukriti uh, who has been the, uh, you know, the ideator for the patient awareness program for organizing this morning session and also being uh, uh, very good at winning the prize also. She has got an additional reward. Sukriti. She is a student uh, representative for uh, MAC ID. And uh, thank you once again for all of your participation and uh, you have also done well in this and for getting selected for the final round, Aditya and Aditi, right? Yeah. And wish you all the best for all the participants and uh, convey the message in the Department of Medicine uh, and give us the feedback. We would like to be associated with all of you more. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a group photo. We have the background here. We can have a group photo. <laughs>